Hare Krishna. I am grateful to be here with all of you today in the Holy Dham of Sri Vindavan. And we are discussing one of the more unusual pastimes from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So I'll talk about three points today in today's session. I'll focus on first, I'll use this whiteboard as a notes to write and draw certain things. Am I audible to everyone behind? Okay, thank you. So I'll just give a first little bit background of the pastime and then I'll look at the spiritual significance of this pastime and then I'll look at the, the approach of our Acharyas in specifically approaching the, in viewing the Bhagavatam. So, in the Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto, there are generally chapters 50 to 90 are broadly considered to be the Dwarka Leela. Now, of course, within the Dwarka Leela, Krishna is already become a statesman of repute. And that's why he's not based in Dwarka most of the time. He's traveling all over. And like this pastime, several other pastimes, they happen outside Dwarka. Mm -hmm. So, here, sometimes the connection of Krishna with the pastimes is a little bit more indirect. See, generally, if we consider a, a movie or a novel, mm -hmm. So, generally it's focused on, say, the journey of one character. Hmm? Okay, this character went here, this character did that, and then this character did that. So, it's focused on that character. Hmm? So, Ramayana literally means the journey of Lord Ram. So, sometimes the 10th canto is called the Krishnayana. It is the journey of Krishna within the Bhagavatam specifically. But, now, within that, sometimes, if you see a movie also, if, say, the hero is going to meet some other character and there's going to be some significant interaction between the two of them, then maybe the camera shifts from the hero to that character to give some backstory of that character. Hmm? Okay, who, why is this so character so special? And then why is the meeting between the two of them so special? Hmm? So, similarly, if you see in most of the 10th canto, the focus is on Krishna. In Vrindavan, mostly it's on Krishna. Sometimes we have things being told from Yashoda's perspective or sometimes from the Parajwasi's perspective. So sometimes there's a discussion between Krishna and between say the Parajwasi's and Nanda Maharaj. How did Krishna lift Govardhan? So at that time it's being spoken from their perspective. The focus is not on Krishna. So oh, here there's an entire backstory where the focus is not on Krishna right now. So when we have the when we have sort of these tangents in the storyline. So the tangents in the storyline can be in two ways. They can be at a different place. That means, okay, while this was happening here, this was happening over here. Hmm? Then they can be at a different time. Okay, these two people are meeting, but this was happened in the past. And this is a history of these two characters. So like two people meet. And they seem to have, be very friendly, like Krishna and Sudama meet. Now, we don't meet Sudama in the Bhagavatam any time before. So, he is not introduced in any of the earlier chapters. So, when we meet Sudama for the first time, it is that Sudama and Krishna are friends. We are told at that time only. So, we go to the past. And third can be, it can be different place and time. So, that means the backstory is not just happening parallelly with this at a different place. It is happening in the past, at a different time and a different place. So, that's what is the kind of the backstory that is of Muchukunda over here. So, for Muchukunda, it's a long time before and it's a different place. He is fighting on behalf of the Devtas. He's doing some extraordinary service to the Devtas. And from that time onwards, so generally speaking, you could, if you want to know people, say we meet people, we generally ask, what is your name, what do you do, where are you from? 
and that's the only way we get to know people. But to really know a person, we need to know their desires. Not just their desire, oh, I like to eat gulab jamun. Uh, you know, I like, I like this kind of, this color clothes or whatever. That's, that's preferences. That's fine to know. But there are, there are preferences people have. And sometimes we visit somebody's house and they know exactly the kind of food we like and they cook that. Oh, okay, that's a personal relationship over there. That's nice, but beyond that, there is like a driving passion of a person's life. What do they really want to do? Somebody's driving passion might be to, say, build a temple for Krishna. Somebody wants to distribute books. You know, somebody wants to teach Shastra to everyone, inspire everyone to memorize shlokas. So as devotees, also we are defined by our desires. So in the Bhagavatam also introduce cases, characters based on their desires in many places. So for example, when Kubja is introduced for the first time, she serves Krishna and her desire is to be with Krishna. And then Krishna fulfills that desire but Krishna also purifies her in the process. So people are defined by their desires. So when we are getting to know people, it's sometimes through their words, sometimes through their actions, glances, we come to know what are their desires. That's when we really understand people. So now what is Muchukun's desire? That is the background of this verse. So now it's not that people tell their, sometimes people just tell their desires very upfront. You know, I, somebody will say, I want to become the CEO of my company. I want to get a bigger house than this house. Mm. I was just in one place uh, uh, and then the devotee told me that this, you know, there's this big property which is run down over there. The devotee over there told me, you know, I want to get this whole property for his con so that we can have the biggest place in his con for this place for his con, biggest place in the city for his con. So it's a noble desire to have. So, so sometimes people are upfront in telling their desires. Sometimes they are not. So here, what has happened is that Muchukund has done extraordinary service. Now we could say, was Muchukun's driving desire? I just want to sleep without being disturbed. Well, not really. If you say somebody's driving desire, I want to sleep. Well, you know, there's nothing driving you that is. Isn't it? So that is not really a characteristic of any special person. And certainly that would not make a person special enough to actually see Krishna. Is it? Sleeping is fairly an ordinary desire. If you see Ahar Nidra Bhai Maithunamcha, within that, the desires for, you could say, Ahar and uh, Maithun, hmm? uh, those drive people, they make people active. For food, we search. We have to search for food, for, for procreation, for, for sex, sex. People have to search and find a partner. So, those are desires that put a person in Rajoguna. Now, bhaya, when we are defending ourselves, well, it's a combination of rajas and tamas to some extent. Now, we can run fast, but generally, it's a person fleeing is, there's some little bit of fear over there, so it's tamas. But you could say it's a combination of rajas and tamas, because in bhaya, it's not just defending, it's also fighting. Hmm? So, if we consider the spectrum of desires that a person has, we all have different kinds of desires. So typically the, among the bodily desires we can say the ahara and the maithun. These are in rajas, broadly speaking. Then we can say the bhaya, the fear. Now because of fear people can run away, but because of fear people can also make a lot of arrangements. That okay I'm going to do this, I'm going to build this big house with with a lock properly and I'll spend the money to buy it, I'll make investments and save for the future. So bhaya can be both rajas and tamas. But generally nidra, we would say, is largely tamas. It is in the mode of ignorance. So when, now of course, see sleeping itself is a biological need. So sleeping itself is not in the mode of ignorance. The sleeping is what is required. If it were all sleep were in the mode of ignorance, Krishna would not say you have to be regulated in it. Yukta hara viharasya. So it is 
when we sleep too much or when we sleep at the wrong time that is what is tamasic so sometimes as devotees we say i have a lot of service to do i have to do this or service is our reason or sometimes service is our excuse because of which we may sleep very late and then we wake up and the nidra devi becomes very merciful at two times for devotees <laughs> japa and class is it our mercy just comes unlimitedly <laughs> so now what is happening over here if we don't sleep at the right time we just sleep at the wrong time <laughs> we can't cheat sleep basically so sleeping itself is not in the mode of ignorance but just craving to sleep you know somebody asks what would you like to do so just imagine if we get to meet our spiritual master and most of us would love to spend some time with our spiritual master and we some of us may get more association some of us get less association and we get a spiritual master maharaj i just want that i should sleep and nobody disturb me we may say you know are you you're wasting your time with the spiritual master that you can do anywhere <laughs> why, why would you when you're talking with your spiritual master ask for something like that so we, that that really means you have there is, there is there are all kinds of addiction we just really know about substance addiction like food addiction and so like alcohol or drugs or something like that now there is also something called as food addiction it's like we have alcoholics there are foodaholics so foodaholics is people who just that can be both when krishna says yukta this a yukta is eating too much and eating too little also so eating too much is what leads to obesity but eating too little is often a big problem especially among young women where they are very figure conscious and then they just stop eating anorexia and this can be serious problems but the point is so one can have an unhealthy relationship with food in terms of either too much or too little so that's understandable but uh, you know food and food addiction is there but is there something like sleep addiction <laughs> you know there is insomnia where people have a, people are not able to sleep but if somebody is addicted to sleeping we might say that is okay what's wrong with you we will just we will not call it sleep addiction we will just use a more polite word for it you are lazy <laughs> is it it <laughs> it's not polite <laughs> but but the point is if somebody has such a driving desire to sleep it, we would not really think that person is very transcendental is it it it's not transcendental it is really ignorant see there is there is something above the three modes there is something you can see. is there something below the three modes also <laughs> so it's like that so here bujukun is asking please let me sleep without interruption devutas are also telling him we can give you any benediction except for liberation because that only vishnu can give but still they, they are being very generous they are clearly very pleased with him say we can give you any benediction and if somebody is asking just let me sleep You know, we may wonder what does this tell us about the consciousness of that person? Is it? Why would somebody ask for something like that? So normally we would consider very strange, and we would not consider certainly that person to be a uh, very elevated person. Hmm? So once I was talking, I was heard over a over a conversation between two devotees. You know, the first devotee was telling the other devotee was speaking something. The second devotee was telling you know, you know, we are told to respect everyone. I am really struggling to respect you, but I have to tell you, I am failing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very polite way of telling someone. <laughs> I disrespect you. <laughs> but the point is you would if you hear like this is somebody going to the deities and praying oh krishna please just let me sleep without any interruption you know we will also say, i'm struggling to respect you but i'm failing <laughs> so you would say what is going on with muchukund why is he asking for such a benediction so sometimes what happens is if you want to understand so understanding requires looking at the action 
but also looking at the context of the action. So if we just look at the action, then we may or may not be able to understand so well. So if somebody just say is, is I say go back, if somebody is just requesting the spiritual master or their authority, I just want to sleep without interruption. It's a very lazy person, you might say. But suppose there was a Janmashtami festival and before that they had been organizing and four or five days that person has not slept at all because they are so dedicated to service. And then they say, I just want to sleep without any interruption. Now, okay, that puts things in a different light. So generally speaking, what happens is, when we look at a person, there are two, or we look at any action. We can look at that action in isolation or we can look at it in, in context. Now, what happens is, we only see that action at that time. And we can't see things in isolation generally. So we place things in our own context. So, okay, if somebody is asking, I just want to sleep. Now, what context can you put this in? So we think this person is really lazy or this is a little strange. But if you look at the backstory, the very fact that the devotas are so pleased that the devotas are ready to give any benediction to him, that itself indicates that he must have done something extraordinary. So, in this, although he is desiring, I want to sleep. I just don't want to be interrupted while sleeping. That itself is not necessarily tamasic. Because he has exerted himself into an extraordinary degree in the service of the devutas before this. So, there is sleep which is yukta, which is desirable. And there is sleep which is ayukta, which is undesirable. So, that is tamasic. So this desire itself might seem tamasic, but it is not. It is that he has worked so hard, I just want to sleep right now. There is that well-known story of Durvasa Muni, where he is eating a lot of food once he is invited to place. And then he says that, that actually Durvasa is a Nirahari and Krishna is a Brahmachari. So how is that possible? He says, Durvasa says, he just ate so much, how can be Nirahari? He says, it's not, I am not eating, it's just his body is eating. And that, so I am a sage, if I don't, some days I don't get anything to eat, I don't bother. Some days I get a lot to eat, I eat. So, it's convenient philosophy for us if we apply it only in the second part. <laughs> is it? <laughs> so, so, the idea is that here, so a person might exert their body a lot at one time and then they might just... Uh, want to rest at the other point. So the desire is, the point I'm making is the desire is not tamasic. And that's why the devutas are pleased. Generally the devutas are pleased by somebody who does a lot of tapasya. Specifically tapasya to please them. So Muchukun's tapasya, his is actually fighting for them. His fighting, his service for the fighting on behalf of the devutas. And that itself is extraordinary. Because normally people pray to the devatas for protection. Hmm? So if the devatas ask someone to protect them, to fight for them, that itself indicates that person is very special. Hmm? So generally, you know, if some criminal comes to our, we are threatened by somebody, we see some criminal going by our house and we call the police for protection. But imagine the police call someone for protection. <laughs> <laughs> then we would say that, okay, if the police needs protection, then, then something is either seriously wrong with the police or it's that the threat is so big that the, whoever the police are calling, they must be very special, isn't it? The police are generally equipped to deal with domain, uh, internal threats. So normally we may have some thieves, we may have some terrorists. But if somebody, the, if there's some place there is a nuclear weapon being found or the threat of a um, weapon of mass destruction, that the police may not be equipped to deal with. And the police may call somebody from the army who is expert at that. So the point is, if you want to understand it, Muchukun's stature, the fact that he was fighting on behalf of the devutas 
indicates how glorious he was. And the fact that he kept fighting and fighting for a long time on their behalf indicates that not only was he capable, but he was also dedicated. Generally, if somebody wants success in any area, first they have to have ability. They have to be talented. But being talented alone is not enough. Being dedicated is also required. We may have talent, but we have to consistently practice, consistently apply ourselves. So Muchukun Maharaj was both. Because he was such a good fighter, that's why he was called by the Devutas. And he fought for so long for them that the Devutas were pleased. So this was his tapasya. And he did it in a phenomenal way. And that's why the Devutas are so pleased that they are now asking, what do you want? So it's not a tamasic desire. It's a reward for an extraordinary amount of hard work. And then that is what he desires at that particular time. Now Krishna can work in mysterious ways. And we will see that his reward, Muchukun's reward turns out to be just not just uninterrupted sleep. It's uninterrupted sleep for a long time. But when the sleep is interrupted, then he gets the darshan of Krishna eventually. And that's how he becomes liberated. So the point is that there could be some desire which is a very prominent desire at a particular time. But that does not mean that that desire itself will determine the destination of the person. That is a desire that is prominent at that particular time. Like somebody has not eaten for maybe 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, 40 hours. Somebody is fasting. Now at that time the first thing they may desire is, I just want to eat food. But that does not mean that that person is defined by that desire. So it's like, you know, among our desires, there some could be urgent, but some could be the important desires for us. They are the desires that define us. So for Muchukund, the urgent desire was to sleep. But his defining desire was his service attitude. He fought on behalf of the Devutas, and he fought on their behalf of them because he had that attitude of service. And eventually, he will be rewarded for this desire. So, that's what will happen later on as his pastime moves on. But the specific desire he has is to sleep. And for that, what does he ask? Now, again, sometimes if you look only in a context, it might seem a little bit off because again if you see what is his desire that whoever wakes me up what should happen to that person I glance on that person and then what happens that person burns to death so the benediction that he asks at one level you know when I was new in the ashram at that time, we would have a devotee go out in the morning at 4 o'clock and wake up everyone who's sleeping in the ashram. So, one of our devotees, very, very good at Shastra, my friends, he was very good at Shastra. He said, you know, sometimes when this person comes to wake me up, I feel I, would have, I should have Muchukun's benediction. <laughs> <laughs> so, at one level, that desire might seem very... <laughs> Tamasik. So, is Vuchukun's desire like, who is the other person in the Bhagavatam who desires that somebody else just get burned by interaction with me? Bhasmasur. Vrakasur or Bhasmasur. The same character is sometimes known by different names. So, this Bhasmasur, what is his specific desire? That whoever I touch with my hand, on their head, my palm on their head, so like you give Ashirwad, your Ashirwad is? <laughs> there is instant Agni Samskar. <laughs> so now, is Muchukun's desire similar to Bhasmasur's desire? Now Bhasmasur is often considered, not just Nasura, but is also considered an example of tamasic austerity. That somebody performs austerity by which that person uh, gets a power that is immensely destructive. Prabhupada in some places compares this power this, to the weapons of mass destruction. 
that here Basma Sur desire, I just touch someone's head and that person gets burned up. And nowadays we are developing weapons by which you just press a button and etam drushti mavashtabhya nashtatmano alpa buddhaya prabhavanti ugra karmana kshayaya jagato hita kshayaya jagato in 16.9 in the Bhagavad Gita says that those who are demoniac they think that progress is increase in the power of destructiveness if I can have more and power, more power to destroy others that's progress so it could seem that that Bhuchukun's desire is similar to Basmasu's desire. But there is a difference. See, the key difference is that Basmasur, what is his purpose is to destroy at will. Hmm? There's, it's, there's a very different context or intent. Bhuchukun's purpose is not to destroy. His purpose is that I just need rest. And no one should interrupt my rest. That is the point. His point is not to, that whoever interrupts me, that person gets destroyed. That is true. But the purpose is not to destroy. The purpose is, I just want undistracted rest. Like one of my friends is a, he's an author. So he's a grasta. He says, you know, I live with my family and I write at home. So he, he said, on my study room where I write, I put a notice, you know. I am writing now. If anybody disturbs me during my writing, I politely tell you, I'll break your legs. <laughs> so, so, he says writing is serious work. I have caught the flow of thoughts. If somebody interrupts me, you know, one minute of interruption means can one hour of flow of thought can go away for me. So, so now, it's, the point is not that I want to break people's legs. The point is, don't interrupt me. Isn't it? <laughs> so, so, so we have to understand the focus, or rather the purpose. So we could say the benediction might be similar, but the purpose is very different. The purpose is not simply to destroy at will. The purpose is to do something which at that time is either important or is urgent. So, the, so again, that's why if, if you see in the Bhagavad Gita, one of the key principles is bondage occurs not because of the action that we do. It is because of the motivation for the action. Why are we doing what we are doing? That's what determines whether, that's what primarily determines whether we get bound by an action or not. So, in that very confusingly famous verse in the Bhagavad Gita 4, 17 and 18, that series, Karmanya Karmaya Pashe Da Karmani Cha Karmaya Sabuddhiman Manusheshu Sayuktaha Katsna Karma Krishna says that Karmanya Karmaya Pashe Now, Prabhupada says, translate that as one who sees inaction, inaction and action in inaction. So, this is both a tongue twister and a brain twister. <laughs> <laughs> but simply what it means is that action in inaction. That means say some rioters are rioting in a city and the police don't do anything at that time. So there is inaction, so the police by not doing anything will be held criminal, will be held, will be held responsible. So the inaction, they have done inaction but there is action in inaction, action in the sense that they are held responsible for that. So, the point is that it's not just what you do, it's the context in which you do it. Why are you doing it? So, there are riots if you don't stop someone. So, normally violence is bad, but if somebody is rioting and somebody stops them at that time, that is considered good. So, so the acts of motivation is important. So, Muchukun's motivation is not destructive. It is just that he wants uninterrupted rest because he has done such extraordinary service. And one last point I'll make. So, we look at the background of this pastime, we try to look at the character of Puchukunda. He is not a tamasic character by any means, neither in terms of his desire for sleep or his desire for destructiveness. It's not primarily a desire for sleep, it's a desire for rest. Hmm? After having done a lot of service. And the desire is not for destruction. The desire is for uninterrupted rest. 
So the prior, the focus has to be clear. Now, if you see Prabhupada, uh, the Prabhupada's followers in the commentary, very nonchalantly are describing in an alternate reading, there are these verses which are to be added, which are there in these verses. So if you look at the narrative itself, so this, the previous verse said that the varam richnisva, that what vara do you want, you please ask us for this vara. If you go beyond before that, they are saying, Muchukun defended for a long time, Tad Raksham so Akaro Chiram. For a Chiram, for a long time he defended them. And then, when they got Kartikeya, they said, Muchukun, thank you for your service. Now you can take rest. Now you can leave. You have done your service. Um, so now they are telling him, they are also giving him some grim news. That you have been fighting so long that your family and everybody has departed now. So, now, but still, because you have fought for us, please ask for some service. So it's interesting in this, in this main narrative of the Bhagavatam, what was the vara that Muchukund asked is not mentioned at all. So the Devta say, please ask something and after that Muchukund simply goes and he goes to sleep. He goes to the cave and goes to sleep. And then, so when is this happening? This is, the narrative was that uh, the Yavana was, uh, Kali Yavan was, chasing Krishna and Krishna hid in the cave and Kalyavan was burned. And how was he burned? The backstory goes over there. So the backstory meets over here. So the point I'm making over here is within the narrative of the Bhagavatam, what was the specific vara, benediction that Muchukund asked is not mentioned at all. And what is that benediction? That he is saying, Bhakti Dasar is saying that an alternating reading of this chapter use these true extra verses. So, here the point that is important is there are several places in the Bhagavatam where sometimes this verse is read in this way, sometimes this verse is read in that way. So there are variations in the text of the Bhagavatam, variations in the text. These are of three kinds broadly. There are variations within words, there are variations within lines, and there are variations within verses itself. Hmm. So for example, in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita itself, there is the verse spoken by Duryodhan. That he says that he's comparing the strength of the Kauravas and the Pandavas, and there is the Balam, balam eva abhi eva abhi rakshantu and bhima eva abhi rakshantu. That, what is that? Aparyaptam tadasmakam balam bhima abhi rakshitam. Paryaptam tadame tesham balam bhima abhi rakshitam. So, so, there is that verse 110 in the Bhagavad Gita. So, there, paryaptam and aparyaptam. So, aparyapta can mean insufficient or aparyapta can mean immeasurable. So I'm not going to get into technicalities of the verses because we're running out of time. But the point is that the Acharyas who talk, this verse can be read in different ways. And they don't make a huge fuss out of it. So there is, words as example is, 110 is aparyaptam. So aparyaptam, is it immeasurable or is it? So, the, so here, it's more of the same word being read differently. That's quite common. But sometimes the words themselves are Matayo and Gatayo, for example, one of the verses and the prayers of uh, Prahlad Maharaj. Hmm? There is Matayo and Gatayo. There are, there are variants like that. So sometimes there will be one line which will be different within a verse. And sometimes there will be verses themselves may be different. So here, the Puranas and the Vedas, there is a significant difference between Shruti and Smriti. See, in Shruti, the power is primarily in the words. And that's why even the Shruti is also required, also there are some variants are there, but they are relatively less. And in the Smriti, the key point is not, is not the, the exact words. The key point is 
the essential meaning. So even if some sentences, so even if some verses, so, so Bhakti Sahas Thakur is not, in his commentary, he is not making a big UN cry, oh, who was that rascal who deleted these verses from the Bhagavatam? Or who is the rascal who is saying there are more verses in the Bhagavatam? This is Bhagavatam as it is, no changes at all. He is not making a big UN cry out of it. Why? Because the essence, the essence does not change. So in Shruti, the literal words are also important. In Smriti, the essential meaning is important. It is the essential meaning that is important. That's why when Srila Prabhupada was publishing his Bhagavad Gita as it is, at that time, Hagriv Prabhu was assisting Prabhupada as his editor. And Hagri Prabhu was trying to make the translations of the verses very poetic. And Prabhupada initially entertained him, engaged him, saw that he's serving nicely. And after some time, Prabhupada said, you know, the translations are not that important. The purports are what are missing. So he said, don't spend so much time on translations. He somebody, when somebody says, don't spend so much time, what they are saying is, don't spend so much of my time on this. Is it? <laughs> don't take so much of my time. <laughs> because if somebody, some subordinate of ours is taking a lot, spending a lot of time on something, when they have problems, they are going to come to us. So, <laughs> when this, uh, don't spend so much time on this, Prabhupada said. So the thing is, that, uh, Prabhupada said, just take anyone's translation, take Dr. Dr. Take Radhakrishnan's translations. And, Hagri Prabhu was shocked. Prabhupada, that would be plagiarism. He says, that is, how can you take Radha Krishna's translations? He says, the Bhagavad Gita is not Radha Krishna's, it is Krishna's. It's Krishna's words. <laughs> now you could say the specific translations are attributable to him. But the point was, Prabhupada was not fixated so much on specific words. So, the essential meaning was what was important for Prabhupada. So, Sometimes there is the editing of Shri Prabhupada's books and there is a lot of controversy that comes over. And it's understandable, Prabhupada's books are the basis for our, our movement. At the same time, rather than getting too fixated on that, we need to focus on what is Prabhupada's essential message. And rather than sometimes we get too caught in this thing and there can be demonization of the other side and it becomes very bitter. Now I understand the sentiments involved over there and the sentiments need to be carefully addressed. But at the same time, the principle is that in Smriti, the essential message is more important. So, so Bhaktivedanta Thakur is not making a huge issue over here. Oh, this alternate reading. Yeah, that's fair enough. You have this alternate reading. You say, this reading. If you have this, then it makes sense. Okay, why is he sleeping? So like that in the Gita Press, Bhagavad Gita and Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, there's one verse that is different, 13.1, which is there in the question that Arjuna asks. Kshetra, Kshetra, Geyo, Revam. That verse about... The sixth question that he's asking, that is not there in the Gita Press Gita. But it doesn't really make a difference. That question, if it is there, the flow from flow becomes very clear, a little more clear. Why is Krishna speaking these word things? But if that verse is not there, it doesn't make such a big difference. So we don't we have to know that what is the essence, what is centrally important, and what is secondarily or tertiarily important. So the approach of our acharyas here is showing us. And okay, if some verses more are there in the Bhagavatam, they just give a greater clarity to the whole context. It's not that those verses are suddenly saying that we are all God. They're not touching Mayavad over here. So if, if somebody says, you know, there's alternate reading of this verse or alternate reading of chapter and that, those verses are conveniently supposed, supposed, supporting their philosophy. Then it's a matter of question. Then we can say there's some ulterior motive over here. So, but... If it's not that any new philosophy is being inserted by the addition of certain verses or a central philosophical point is being deleted because some verses are not there, then it's not a big issue. So this is the last point I'll conclude with. See, intelligence, buddhi can have many different meanings. Buddhi in sattva guna, pravrittim cha nirvittim cha, karya karye bhaya bhaye, bandham moksham cha yavetti buddhi sa partha sattviki. In 1830, Krishna talks about intelligence in the mode of goodness. So, one way to understand this is that to keep the big things big 
and to keep the small things small. So this requires buddhi. If sometimes we may have intelligence, but we may use our intelligence to make small things big. And that is how sometimes fighting starts happening. I mean, over small things can become very big and we can start fighting. There was a, see in Christianity there are the two main groups, there are Catholics and there are Protestants. So once there was a Christian monastery, a nunnery basically, where Christian nuns would be trained and there was a senior nun. So there was a young, uh, young girl who grew up in the, mona in the nunnery. It was expected she would also become a nun. And she told her, senior, he says, I decided what I want to do after I grew up. Yes, what do you want? I want to become a prostitute. He says, what? What did you say, oh girl? He says, I want to become a prostitute. Oh, thank God. I thought you said I want to become a protestant. <laughs> 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 so, somebody can make sectarian differences so big that they consider that becoming a protestant is worse than becoming a prostitute. <laughs> so, intelligence means to keep small things small and to keep big things big. That way we can avoid unnecessary conflicts. So, I'll summarize what we discussed. So, I discussed three main points today. So, we are discussing the pastime of Muchukunda and we discussed Muchukun's desire, Muchukun's defining characteristic. So generally we would consider a person's defining characteristic is their driving desire. So, but is his driving desire to sleep? That's what it, it might seem because that's what he asks for. But that driving desire is not sleep, he was defined by his service attitude. And that's why he had, he had so much he was both talented and dedicated. His talent was that even the Devutas asked him to fight for him, them, and he was so dedicated he fought for a long, long time. He was not just for a few days or a few months, for years and decades and generations he was fighting. He had lost all his family because they all passed him during that time. So that's the extraordinary amount of service that he had done. And then there might be an urgent need. So somebody might be a very dedicated devotee, but if they are fasting for a long time, the first thing, they may come to Vrindavan, instead of saying, instead of taking darshan, say, I, I'm, can you have some prasad? Say, come to Vrindavan, first take darshan. He says, no, but I've, been, I've not eaten anything for 72 hours now. Okay, then we understand. So, it's at a particular time, the need might be there of a person to sleep, but that doesn't make them tamasic. So we discuss, normally, we might consider sleep to be tamasic, but we have to look at the action, and we also have to look at the context of the action. So that's when we'll get a complete picture. And then we discussed about Muchukun's benediction. Was that a destructive benediction? That he's asking like Bhasmasur had asked, let me destroy whoever I had the power to destroy. It was not destructive because his purpose was different. His purpose was not destruction, his purpose was uh, that he just wanted uninterrupted sleep. So Muchukun's purpose was so that he had served and he now got it to get some well-deserved rest. If you consider Bhasmasur's purpose was very different. His purpose was self to destroy at will. So that was very different. Last point was we discussed about how these extra verses and uh, how we can see these extra verses that are there. At one sense, these are, they give some important point over here. That Bhuchukun, what he, the Devutas blessed him and what are the blessings that he sought. So that is uh, told through these verses, but it's not that big. So extra verses, some interesting information is there, that's fair enough. If that is all that is coming over there, we can take that information, accept, but don't make a hue and cry out of it. Don't make this into a issue for fighting. That's what, ha if that happens, then that is destructive. Intelligence, so, if it is completely, when the extra verses are giving a, a completely different philosophy, then that is something which is a serious question. Is this authentic? If it is authentic, how did it get removed? Who has added it? That has to be considered. So, 
Intelligence means to keep small things small and to keep big things big. Or rather, keep big things big and thereby keep big small things small. So in this way, the same approach we can have when we are looking at some of the issues in our movement also, be it our like editing of Prabhupada's books or other issues, how much are they affecting the ultimate purpose of Srila Prabhupada in the moment? Based on that, we can decide whether they are worth fighting over or not. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any question? Yes, Mataji, behind. Thank you for the class, very detailed. I would like to know about the books of Prabhupada uh, in the detail, because um, uh, already many person ask me this question, is it uh, bona fide for Prabhupada that we wrote again the commentary, or that we changed the original text? Okay, so I'll give a broad outline because this can become very detailed. You're talking about the editing of Prabhupada's books only. Is that the question? Okay, so basically what happened was that there was, a, it was go, went through three layers. If you see the first was, most of the times Prabhupada typed or and later dictated. So if he dictated, that was the audio form that we had. From that audio, let's say we got the text one and initially in the 1960s devotees were very new at that time when they were hearing the audio and transcribing sometimes they they made mistakes in transcribing because uh, they, the, the Sanskrit was not familiar to them Prabhupada's accent was not familiar to them so that was text one then there was or let's let put it's text one you can put it let's put it as version one So the first version came with the transcription being done and converted into text. Now what happened afterwards was when the devotees became a little more experienced, then there was version 2 which was again coming from the dictated text. Mm -hmm. So at this point, what the purpose was that there's definitely a difference between version 1 and version 2. Hmm. And if you consider version 1 to be the original one, then version 2 is different. But the reason version 2 is different is that they try to make version 2 more in alignment with, you could say, text 1. Hmm. So quite often version 2 and version 1 are compared and the changes in version 2 are highlighted, which is uh, complicated. But if you see version 2 is more aligned with text 1 than version 1 is. But then we have version 3. Now in version 3 what happened was there was something more that was done. See Prabhupada did not have an app like Pocket Vedas or something for like that with We have. So when we have to quote a verse, you know, Prabhupada would generally not put the verse number. Because Prabhupada had memorized an extraordinary number of verses, but he had not memorized verse numbers. So when the devotee, when Prabhupada would quote a verse, devotees would insert the verse numbers over there. Now sometimes Prabhupada would quote a verse, sometimes Prabhupada would get some part of the verse a bit differently than what it is in the text. So, Janma karma chayde me divam evam yoti tata tektva deham punarjamana naiti mameti so arjuna. So Prabhupada made so Kaunte or something like that. So the devotees would change that also. So now, what are the extent to which some things can be changed? So there was some, some issue. So it's like if Prabhupada said something that is different from the original text, the so Kaunte, so Arjuna, there we say we should clearly we should change it. If Prabhupada, while talking one time in lecture in our transcript, he says, King, King Dashrath had two wives. Now he had three wives clearly. Now, Prabhupada would also have wanted to change that. So basically, if it's not alignment with Shastra, 
that needs to be changed. If it's not aligned with normal rules of grammar, it needs to be changed. Prabhupada wanted that. But what are the boundaries to which editing should be done? So in version 3, there were a few things where the boundaries might have been crossed because Prabhupada, it's not that devotees are ill-intentioned. They sometimes felt that, okay, this will be clearer. If you use this word instead of this word, it will be clearer. But Prabhupada had used a different word. Maybe we should keep Prabhupada's word as it is. So it was not in any way ill-intentioned. But yes, on a few occasions, between when you go to the version 3, which is an attempt to make Prabhupada's words, words clearer, sometimes some things went off. So Prabhupada wanted, so what Prabhupada himself wanted editing. There's no doubt about that. Prabhupada himself, he appointed. And basically he wanted it to be good in terms of English grammar, punctuation. Prabhupada wanted it not just good, perfect, he wanted it to be. Now beyond that, the devotees did certain things and what they, some of the things which they did was questionable. So now there's discussion going on and things are being brought back into a more clear alignment with what Prabhupada had said. So that's happening. So I would say that Prabhupada wanted editing, but Prabhupada was so busy that Prabhupada, that the devotees didn't have the time to specifically discuss the boundaries till which editing should be done and till should not be done. So normally speaking, how it works, I'm also a published author. So uh, there are, the, the, normally the editors and the authors work together. The editor suggests some editing and the author says, do this, don't do this. And the editor sometimes says, you know, this is important. The editor says, no, this is important. It has to be kept like that. So there are a lot of discussions. And in fact, there are books published with respect to famous authors. There are books published of solely the correspondence between the editor and the author. And editors and authors are said to have what is called a love-hate relationship. It's like, I want you and I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is, a, it is a complicated process. In the case of Prabhupada, it is, Prabhupada just didn't have the time for all that kind of thing. So, what the boundaries should have been, uh, that maybe the devotees, some devotees are over enthusiastic. And now we are becoming more cautious. So things are being changed. So I do, I have, from what I have, I studied this issue quite a bit. I haven't seen anything which is ill-intentioned. I haven't seen anything which is an outrageous change. I've seen some changes which I as a writer also feel are excessive. But they're very few. I say out of 100 changes, maybe 4 or 5 changes, I feel they're excessive. But even if they're excessive, they are not uh, transgressive in the sense that it's not a new philosophy is being inserted or completely the meaning has been changed. So it's not an issue to hugely fight over. So to summarize three things, see Prabhupada clearly wanted editing. Second is that the boundaries to what extent editing had to be done were never clearly defined because of the circumstance. And third is where excessive editing has been done, it has not been in any way destructive to the core message. But if it's excessive, then some things are being pulled back. So I don't think it's an issue to fight over at present. Does it answer the question? Thank you very much. Grantraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupad ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki, Nitai Gaur Premanandi. Srila Prabhupad ki.